Thanks, Carl. I wish I had a nickel for every time I've been introduced as Jeff. <laughs> uh, I would first want to just start by thanking um, Al Moore and Alan and the rest of the team who put this together today. This has uh, been a very good conference. Uh, I was here last year, and uh, it's amazing that uh, they were able to improve on last year, which I thought was a great conference. So thank you, and uh, I know everybody, everybody here really appreciates it. Um, most of you probably are not familiar with Blue Rock. Um, we're an ESCO energy services company, founded in 2003, we're in Syracuse. And we serve electricity and natural gas to commercial, industrial, and residential customers. Our primary market focus is small to mid-sized customers. Two things I want to talk about specifically is sort of the state of the renewable market for end-use customers today, and then how that market can be improved by improving the market itself. Um, first question is, why would customers go green? Um, and what we hear from our customers is the primary reason is it makes business sense for them. Um, one of the examples is we have a microbrewery um, as one of our customers. He's convinced he can sell more beer with green logos on his uh, doors, green logos on the growlers, that kind of thing. Uh, he's very successful and it works. Um, they like the fact that they can brand their own business, differentiate from the competition. There is a fair amount of advertising and marketing value and many of our customers look at it through that prism when they're, they're evaluating the cost. Right now, we have about 5% of our customers, which represents about six to six and a half percent of our sales have gone green. Now, a year ago, that was about 3%. So we've seen an increase in the number of customers that want to green up their supply. One of the things that Cox mentioned this morning is that natural gas, the low prices for gas dropping from uh, about six bucks uh, three years ago, 2010, to about four dollars this morning. Uh, that low price has actually hurt renewables. I see it exactly the opposite. What we hear from our customers is that has created some budget room. So let's say you were spending thousand dollars a month on electric. Today you're spending eight hundred dollars. That gives them two hundred dollars that they could spend on renewables. And we see people actually looking at it that way. They're not looking at it as dollars per decatherm, dollars per megawatt hour, they don't care. They're looking at how many dollars a month am I spending, total dollars. We're purchasing, the study says, uh, hydropower and landfill gas, we're also purchasing biomass. And this gets back to the question that was asked, um, I think when Rich was here, and Alan asked the question, what we're doing is buying uh, direct from small developers, matching that up with our small customers. So when we have a customer, a brewery is an example, that wants to go green, we can go and buy that green supply and sell that to that customer. And we've done that uh, over and over and over in the last five years. Our cost premium is $8 a megawatt, a megawatt hour, 0.8 cents. The utility prices are anywhere from 15 to $25 a megawatt hour. You say, well, how, how you guys buy it cheaper than the utilities. Well, we're buying direct from smaller, smaller suppliers, smaller developers that don't have the resources to participate in some of the other programs. So when we're talking to somebody building a biomass plant in Western New York, he's going to cut a deal with us for both his, his actual uh, of brown component and the green um, together. Here's the, just a list of the different kinds of uh, uh, customers that, that we have that are green. And it's everything from uh, apartment buildings to museums to the New York State Coopers. Um, and part of our promotion, this is just a picture of an ad we ran a couple of, about a year ago actually in the Syracuse paper where we showed um, to put the, the uh, logos for some of our customers out there. Um, 
As I said, one thing that would help the renewable markets would be to make the retail competitive market in New York even better. And there are a few things that I that we're looking at. The first one is that the utilities, in my opinion, should move to being delivery only companies. It's a natural monopoly, it makes sense for them to be delivery only. They currently they distort the market. The prices that you see that are calculated by a utility are not transparent. If you take the natural gas prices from any utility in the state, you look at their tariff, you pull the NYMEX prices, you look at what's going on, you try to correlate it, you can't do it. It can't be done. You see, quote, adjustments. One of the upstate utilities right now as a downward adjustment in January of 40% of their supply cost. So well, that's great, customers are getting a discount. No, in December they got overcharged. And so ESCOs look great in December, our prices were way below the utility. And then comes January and we're above the utility. So what's going on? They can't explain where that came from, and we've asked. There's also been some interesting reports in the media of ESCO prices being high. That analysis is very interesting because what they did in the analysis that was fairly widely reported was they took, we've got around 50 ESCOs in New York State, they reported on seven. And they took three months worth of data from seven out of 50 ESCOs and created some statistics from it. One thing that was mentioned earlier, uh, Chairman mentioned that one of the problems with solar, and we're dabbling in solar a little bit, I agree with you completely, is that you have widely different rules. As a retail supplier, we have exactly the same problem. There's 18 sets of rules in New York State if you want to be an ESCO. 18. And utilities that are both gas and electric have different rules for gas and electric. In Niagara Mohawk, you go, you enroll an electric customer. It starts at the next meter read. You go enroll a gas customer, it starts the next meter read after the first of the month, providing you get it in before the 15th of the previous month. <laughs> and so you try to explain that to a customer and you get all tangled up. If you compare that to someone like Texas, they have one set of rules. Gas and electric is the same across the whole state. It makes it easier for the utilities, makes it easier for the ESCOs, makes it easier for the regulators. Everybody knows the rules. There's ESCO issues. ESCOs aren't perfect. We think there ought to be more stringent licensing requirements. In some ways, it can be too easy to become an ESCO. And I would put us in that bucket, relicense us. Increase some of the reporting, increase some of the standards on marketing. There are bad actors out there that need to be eliminated. And one of the problems is, under the current legislation, the BSC really has one choice. If you screw up, it's the death penalty or nothing. Now, yeah, you can get called up and called in and kind of slapped on the wrist, but there's really no progressive type discipline in there take the bad actors out of the market. There's a lot of brokers who aren't ESCOs. They're like insurance brokers. They're selling products from Blue Rock and half a dozen other competitors of ours, maybe. They aren't required to be licensed. So anybody in this room that wants to go sell electricity tomorrow can say, OK, I'm a broker. I'm going to go sell. Well, do you have to know what the uniform business practices are? You have to have any financial backing. No, nope, you can do anything you want and go out and be an agent. The rules say the ESCO is held liable for that, which makes sense, except that when the broker goes in and he's representing six, seven, eight ESCOs, which one is on the hook for his behavior? Nobody knows. And so, again, from a regulatory perspective, I don't know how you administer that. There's no way you can turn around and make a fair, balanced uh, uh, decision on that. 
Now I say Blue Rock Energy, really what I mean is Phil Van Horn thinks that every customer salesperson ought to have a license. If you want to sell life insurance in this state, you have to have a license. You have to take a test, prove that you know what you're talking about. If we licensed all those people that are calling on customers and they had to wear a badge, which they have to wear a badge today, but if we had their license number on there, that would take a lot of the bad actors out right away and force people to actually know what they're talking about. We have, I apologize for throwing an acronym in there, the UBP is the Uniform Business Practices. It's a very well written document, covers the major issues in enough detail that people know what it is, but not in so much detail that you get lost. It's not a FERC tariff, but it's not always adhered to. And again, the PSC is in a bind because of their requirements on what they can do in terms of enforcement. One component is to have industry admit, uh, administered standards and self-police, sort of a uh, UL sticker for, for ESCOs. And the National Energy Marketers Association in our January meeting, we approved a new strong uh, standard of conduct. You can go look at that, it's on energymarketers.com. Uh, we're not quite done um, because we're looking at how do we enforce that as a trade organization and are we, we aren't quite to the point of saying if you don't follow it, you get disciplined somehow. We are going to set up an arbitration panel. We'll take people from the industry that are retired, don't have a dog in the race anymore, and, and, and put them on an arbitration panel to allow us. So if we see a competitor doing something they shouldn't, we can bring it to an arbitration panel, hammer it out, and try and solve it. The other component is customer education in terms of what can you buy? How does it work? Now, in New York, the best customer education by far was in Orange and Rockland, and they were the first ones to really adopt uh, retail access from industrial right down through to every residential. And when that was implemented, late 90s, there was a tremendous education campaign that was done and it worked very well. And it's been very um, sticky in the sense that the, when we are in uh, Orange and Rockland, the customers know what we're talking about. You don't have to start out with a big long speech on what's the regulation, what's an ESCO, we don't work for the utility. That kind of stuff is already in place. The other two places are Texas and Georgia, where in both areas, the customers there very much understand what's going on. And the last thing is a bit of a commercial. On the natural gas side, you have the NYMEX price. It's not every day. We can all pull out our phones, check the NYMEX price, and see that it closed at 401 or whatever it closed at today. We've developed what we call the electric price index, which takes the data that the ISO puts out every day, every hour, in the day ahead market. We take that day ahead price, aggregate it over 30 days in arrears, run it through the load shapes for uh, a commercial customer in this case, and show what the ISO price is for your bill. So if you had a bill that came out yesterday, whatever that is, it's 5.3 cents or something is what the ISO energy capacity and ancillary price would have been. And just like the NYMEX price is at the Henry Hub in Louisiana, we had to pick a hub for electricity. And we picked the natural center of the New York State electrical system, Syracuse, New York. <laughs> we laughed before. <laughs> We've got St. Lawrence, the St. Lawrence project to the north. We have the nuclear plants right there, Niagara Falls to the east. Albany to the east, or Albany, Niagara Falls to the west, Albany, and then, then the, the New York City to the southeast. So I see Syracuse is the center of the, uh, the New York State Electric System. 
I just want to thank everybody again. I see Rich laughing. He's, he's already agreeing with me. <laughs> the other comment I want to make is it's kind of nice to be on a panel where an RPI alumni wants to make sure his panel works right. <laughs> so what's he doing? He gets two Clarkson guys on that. <laughs> <laughs>